Does he still feel the nails every time I fail? Does he hear the crowd cry, crucify again? Am I causing him pain? Then I know I've got to change. I just can't. Seems that I'm so good at breaking promises, and I treat His precious grace so carelessly. But each time He forgives, what if He reveals the agony He felt on that? Does he still feel the same every time I hear? Does he hear the cloud cry, crucified again? Am I causing him pain? And I know why.
stand as we sing hymn number 407, Because He Lives. Court is now in session. Ladies and gentlemen, we thank you for your participation and your service on this grand jury as we investigate whether or not there has been a grave miscarriage of justice in our history. You will be serving today as members of a grand jury that will be determining whether or not the execution of Jesus from Nazareth was indeed lawful whether or not it was a miscarriage of justice of the most grievous sort. So your participation today is greatly appreciated. I thank you for your service, and I ask you, if you would, to please consider the evidence that is before us that is recorded in the court records that you will find in the book of John, beginning in chapter 18, as we look at verse 19. Would you please stand with me as we give reverence to the court records this morning? The records read as follows. The high priest then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet. 
and in secret I have said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. And when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Do you answer the high priest like that? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now, if you would, look at verse 28 as well. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium, and it was early morning, but they themselves did not go into the praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered and said to him, If he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. And Pilate said to them, You take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, Is it not lawful for us to put anyone it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death? that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus, and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I would not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You rightly say that I am. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. But you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? And then they all cried again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put upon him a purple robe. And they said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold, the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Therefore when Pilate heard that, heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went in again to the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? And Jesus answered, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. From then on Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When the Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out, sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha, and now it was the preparation day of the Passover in about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Peter said to them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then Pilate delivered Jesus to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and led him away. Thank you. you may be seated. You've heard the court records. This is the record of what has transpired a long, long time ago. But yet there are many, many questions that still remain about this man who was executed. Our question this morning is not a question of who did this or who done it, but it is more of a question of who was it done to and why. 
John has recorded for us the trials that Jesus endured at the hands of both the Sanhedrin as well as at the hands of the Roman government. The court records could not be clearer that at the end of it all he was executed in the manner of the Romans. And so we're here today to ask some questions. Is this Jesus of Nazareth, has he been executed rightfully as a criminal? If he was a criminal, then he should have died. And he deserved exactly what he got. But if he was innocent, then perhaps he has died as a martyr, as a, a victim of a corrupt system. Maybe it was just a great tragedy, just a terrible mistake. But your purpose here today, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, is to cast your vote, to make a conclusion, once and for all, for yourselves and those that will hear you, to answer the questions that the world needs to hear. And those questions this morning are twofold. First of all, who was Jesus? And why did he die? Who was Jesus? And why did he die? Having read the court records, is the jury prepared to proceed? If you are prepared to proceed and perform your duty as a member of this grand jury, would you please let it be known by saying I? And let us go before the judge of all the earth and ask his blessings upon these proceedings. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we come before you now and we ask you, Lord, that you would grant to us great wisdom. Lord, we seek to know this day what, what is the manner of your law. Who is this one that was so grossly accused and so grievously executed? Who is this one that we call Jesus of Nazareth? Speak to us today, judge of the universe, and tell us whether or not, through these facts that we have read, whether this man was guilty and deserved to die, whether this man was innocent, was merely a victim of a corrupt system, or whether perhaps there's something more. Speak to us now, we ask, in the name above all, every name, the name of Jesus. And all God's people say, Amen. Walk with this text through this text with me, would you? I want you to see today some facts. Some facts that you and I, as those that will leave this place in just a few minutes and go out into a lost and dying world, some facts that they need to know. Some facts that perhaps we need to be reminded of so that we will have our hearts changed and, and perhaps excited so that the world will capture that excitement that comes from us about who this man called Jesus really is. Who was Jesus and why did he die? Well, let's start with the obvious. Let's start with the assumption that perhaps the Jews were right. If you pick up in verse 20 of chapter 18, would you look at that, please? Verse 20 of chapter 18, you'll notice that the high priest have gathered Jesus together in front of those that represent the government of the day, and they're asking him about his doctrine and about his disciples. And you'll notice that they're doing so because they're trying to pin Jesus with a crime. They are trying to say that Jesus of Nazareth is a blasphemer. Blasphemy was a crime that was punishable by, by death. If blasphemy is, de is defined as someone who is going to profane, slander, scorn, or disrespect God in some way. And if they can pin him with that, then they can say he rightfully deserves to die. And I want to go on record this morning and say to you that if that is true, if Jesus Christ was a blasphemer of God, if he blasphemed God's holy name, if he claimed to be things that he was not, then he should have died exactly the way he did. But let's look at the record and let's see for ourselves. Jesus answered him in verse 20, answering the high priest, and he simply says, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet. I have said nothing in secret. You see what Jesus is saying there? He's saying, look, you want to know what I taught? You've already heard it. 
He didn't say anything in secret. He was not consorting with those behind closed curtains. He was out in the open, and he was teaching in the temple and in the synagogues where the Jews always meet. He's basically saying, I was teaching in the place where you have special authority. And so if I said something out of line, why didn't you say something? Then in verse 21 knowing that the Jewish law required that there be witnesses to any capital crime before execution ever took place, Jesus says, why do you ask me? There's plenty of witnesses to go around. Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. Now, what Jesus is doing here is he is basically challenging the authority of the high priest who has presented no witnesses for the crime of blasphemy. He's saying there are plenty of people out there who can testify. Where are they? which is why, in verse 22, one of the officers responds to Jesus' questions by slapping him across the mouth. Do you answer the high priest like that, he said. Jesus responds, look, if I said something evil, if I said something wrong, if what I said was inaccurate, if I have misrepresented the law in any way, then say so. Bear witness of the evil. But if I have spoken well, if I've said what's right, and if I've said what's lawful, why did you hit me? Jesus always seemed to be responding to questions with questions. Questions that always got right to the heart of the matter. Jesus is is laying it out in front of everybody what's going on here. And seeing that they could find no blasphemy in him, Verse 24 simply records that Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now let's see what Caiaphas can do with him. Now that's stage two of the Jewish trial that is not recorded for us in the records of John, but we do have that in other court records, in Matthew and as well as in Mark. Stage two of the Jewish trial took place before Caiaphas and whatever members of the Sanhedrin that the priest could assemble at that ridiculous hour of the night. And at this place of the trial, Jesus openly admits to being the Son of God. He is asked. Again, the high priest asked him, this is Mark chapter 14, verse 61, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Most High? Pretty direct question. Are you the Christ, the Son of the Most High? And Jesus said, I am. Any ambiguity in that response? pretty clear. Are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? Are you the Son of the Most High? I am, Jesus says. And not only that, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Two phrases that the Jewish people would understood very clearly as Jesus saying, I am God in the flesh. The one who comes in the clouds of heaven can only be God. The one who sits at the the seat of power of God is God. Jesus is saying, not only am I the Son of God, I am God in the flesh. I'm not only the Son of God, I am God the Son. And with that, with those words, they said, what other testimony do we need? You all heard him say it. He said he's the Son of God. Blasphemy. And they tore their clothes. All right. He admits it. He admits openly to being the Son of God. But in order for that to be blasphemy, it has to be untrue. In order for Jesus to have blasphemed God, He has to be something else. For you see, for a mere man to claim to be the Son of God, to be the Son of Man, the Messiah, that would just be outright blasphemy. We'd be defaming and slandering and disrespecting God. But he says in verse 37, as Jesus is talking to Pilate, notice the last part of that verse. He says, I came into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth Here's my voice. Jesus came into the world not to reveal lies, but He came into the world to reveal truth. Those that are His respond to the truth. Here's what I mean by that. If Jesus was not the Son of God and claimed to be so, He was a blasphemer and He should have died. 
But if Jesus really was the Son of God, if He really was God in the flesh, if He is that, that being, then for Him to claim to be anything less would also be blasphemy. And the very fact that this Jesus of Nazareth has been raised from the dead, obviously by God's power, must, must conclusively bring us to the place that we say, God was on His side. God's not on the side of a blasphemer. So I, I say today, to the charge of being a blasphemer, what do you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, say? Is Jesus a blasphemer? I concur. Jesus is no blasphemer. All right? If he's not a blasphemer, then he hasn't committed a crime against God. But maybe it's possible that even though he hasn't committed a crime against God, maybe he's gotten himself caught up in a worldly system that is just out to get righteous people. Maybe, maybe he has gotten so caught up in this system that he too has crossed a line somewhere. Maybe he has gotten himself in trouble with the government. Maybe he hasn't sinned against God. We've established that fact. The jury has ruled. But what about being in trouble with the government? Well, let's take a look at that. As you move on to verse 28 through verse 40, you have this protracted conversation between Pilate, the representative of the Roman government, and Jesus, who is charged with being king of the Jews. Now you'll notice in verse 33 that Pilate asked him the question, are you the king of the Jews? And if we understood this in the original language, it would be a little bit more sarcastic. Are you the king of the Jews? Really? You're the best they've got? Are you the king of the Jews? And notice Jesus' response. Are you speaking this for yourself, or did others tell this concerning me? And Pilate answered with a little bit of distaste in his mouth, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests had delivered to you me. What have you done? I want you to notice Jesus' response, would you, at verse 36? My kingdom is not of this world. Now let me just stop there for a second. For anyone to say, My kingdom implies that they are a king, does it not? They are either a king or they are someone who is trying to take a kingdom from a rightful king. They are either the rightful ruler or they are some kind of insurgent, some type of rebel, someone who's trying to overthrow civil authority or an established government. So our, our question, the second charge that we need to deal with, is, is that what Jesus is guilty of? Now don't cast your vote yet. Are you the king of the Jews? My kingdom is not of this world. Clearly Jesus is claiming to be a king, but he's saying that his kingdom is not a part of the worldly system. He's not in competition with Rome. His kingdom transcends national boundaries and earthly nations. He's not trying to be in competition with Caesar. He already outranks him. He's not trying to be in competition with the Jewish nation or King Herod. He already outranks them. It's not a competition because he's already won. Which is why, even though Pilate, an unbeliever, even though Pilate, the representative of the Roman judge, government, even though Pilate, who is a man who obviously does not know God, nor does he fear Him, this Pilate says on three different occasions in the text that we read, that he finds Jesus innocent. Now, don't let that fact escape you. The Romans didn't care anything about him. They would have just as soon string him up as anything else. But the fact that Pilate says, first of all in verse 38 of chapter 18, notice that emphatic statement. I find no fault in him at all. It would have been a lot easier politically for Pilate to say, well, I think you got a point. Let's just get rid of this guy. But Pilate takes his career in his hands and steps out and says, I find no fault in him at all. Verse 4 of chapter 19. Behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know 
that I find no fault in him. Verse 6 of chapter 19. You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. How many times does Pilate need to repeat himself? You need to understand, Jewish people, I'm the Roman government, I'm the representative of Caesar, and I'm telling you, you've said this man is a threat to the Roman government, and I'm telling you, he's not. You've brought a charge against this man that he's some kind of insurgent, and Pilate, who, who, got, who made it a practice of getting rid of insurgents, Pilate is saying, he's not one. Now as for me, I'm going to have to agree with Pilate. But you're the jury. So on the charge of being an insurgent against a rightfully established government, how do you rule? Is Jesus Christ an insurgent? No. He's not a blasphemer, so he hasn't committed a crime against God. He's not an insurgent, so he's not in rebellion against the government. But yet the court records are clear. He was obviously executed. So, why? Well, perhaps. Perhaps this is just one of those times in which justice and the justice system has demonstrated its imperfections. Perhaps this is just one of those times where it just went down badly and Jesus just got trapped in all this and is merely one more in a long line of victims that has had their rights trampled on by the overreach and miscarriage of justice. Well, let's, let's investigate that, shall we? You'll notice in verse 1 of chapter 19 that even though Pilate finds no fault in him, even though the Jews cannot produce any evidence whatsoever that he is blasphemed, verse 1 says, Then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. This would have been a process in which he would have been whipped with a leather thonged whip. The leather thongs would have been fitted with spikes, bones, scraps of metal, something along that line. And often the recipient of a Roman scourging never survived it. Often they died while tied to the flogging block and never made their way finally to the cross. Verse 2 through verse 3, Jesus is mocked. He's slapped in the face. He is insulted. In verse 6, after all of this mistreatment by the hands of Pilate, the Jews are still not appeased because he, Pilate asks one last time, uh, what are we going to do? And, and they cry out, crucify him, crucify him. It's not enough. Away with this man. Now I want you to notice verse 10. Jesus is brought back in before Pilate again and Pilate asks some questions but Jesus is not answering now and Pilate says, are you not speaking to me? That's really not very wise, you know, because do you not understand that I have the power to crucify you but I also have the power to release you? This isn't over yet, Jesus. You can still get out of this. There's still a way. And I want you to notice verse 11. Notice what it doesn't say. Sometimes what's not in the Bible is just as important as what is in the Bible. You do not read in verse 11 where Jesus falls on his knees before Pilate and says, Oh, please, I'm innocent. For God's sake, don't let this happen to me. I haven't done these things. Please, please, you've got to let me go. Is that the way your Bible reads in verse 11? No, as a matter of fact, we find quite the opposite. Jesus answered rather calmly and rather coolly and simply says to the man who is the most powerful, high-ranking person of the region, he says, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. You, you see what Jesus is saying there? Jesus is saying to the, to the embodiment of all that the world empire of Rome says, he is saying to the Roman authorities, you got nothing that God didn't give you. Now, it's very clear that answering this way when it's your last chance to the guy that can let you go is, is answering in a way that you know is going to get you crucified. Does that make sense to you of the jury? 
So why is it that Jesus is answering in such a way when he is basically saying to this Roman official, listen, this is going to happen, not because you say it will, but because it's God's will. Clearly, Jesus himself is saying that his death is no tragedy, but it is the fulfillment of God's divine plan. So ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I want to ask you one last question. Based on his own testimony, is Jesus a victim? No. Is Jesus a victim? Which is why he said of his own words, I, no one takes my life from me. I have power to lay it down, but I have power to take it up again. Jesus is not a blasphemer. He had committed no crimes against God. Jesus is no insurgent. He has committed no crimes against government. And neither is Jesus a victim of some ruthless mob. So that leads us still, though, to our question, why was it then that he died? And there is only one conclusion that remains. And that is that our beloved Jesus Christ died as a voluntary sacrifice. Jesus died as a voluntary sacrifice. Our sin, my sin and your sin, required the death penalty. I, I want to just say that again. Sin requires the death penalty. Any sin. All sin. Being a sinner is a crime punishable by death. And not just physical death, but spiritual death, being separated from God throughout all eternity. That is what is rightfully due to me and to you. Because we have all sinned and we have all fallen short of God's standard. Our sin requires the death penalty. If we could get our minds around that, and if we could honestly get that into our hearts, we wouldn't treat sin so lightly. If we really understood how grievous sin is, if we really understood that it's my choices that sent Jesus to the cross, if we could really get a hold of that, then, then we wouldn't be so careless with the choices that we make. I deserve the death penalty. But Jesus Christ took that death penalty upon Himself. No one took His life. He gave it, gave it freely. He chose to die in my place because He loved me. And He chose to die in your place because He loves you. So what happens if we reject so great a gift of love? Well, if we reject that, if we reject Jesus, we have rejected the only hope that we ever had. When we understand who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us, then we begin to understand the words of the hymns that we sing this time of year. When we begin to understand who Jesus was and why Jesus died and that He died as a voluntary sacrifice for me and for you in my place from my crimes, when we understand that and we get that down into our soul, then we can, we can get to the place that we, we can sing like we mean. It's one of those hymns that we sing this time of year that I hope never goes away. When I survey the wondrous cross... There's a little pet peeve of mine. We don't do it here, but I know a lot of churches skip over verses. And sometimes when we skip over verses, we skip over the, the really good theology in those songs. That last verse, that last verse of when I survey the wondrous cross goes something like this. Where the whole realm of nature mine, if I owned it all, were the whole realm of nature mine, that would be a present far too small. Love so amazing, love so divine, demands my soul, my life, my, my all. So, what about you? 
What about you, dear sir? What about you, dear ma'am? What, what, about, what about you, members of the jury? Are you aware today that Jesus died, not just for the world, but that Jesus died for you? Are you aware that Jesus died in your place? Are you aware that those nails, that crown of thorns, all of, those, all of the mistreatment, all of the slaps, all of the insults, are you aware that all of that was due us and more? And are you aware that Jesus stepped in your place and said, I'll take it. I'll take it. I'm no blasphemer. I'm no insurrectionist. I'm no insurgent. I'm not guilty of anything, which is why I can take it on me. What about you? Have you come to the place to where you are willing to receive that voluntary sacrifice? Are you, or have you come to the place to where you're willing to say, you know what, I'm a sinner. I've tried to be good enough, but I can't be good enough. I know I'm not good enough, and I'm never going to get there. Have you got to that place yet? What about you that's here this morning and, and you say, you know what, I, I get it. I finally get it. I need a Savior. But I've never asked Jesus to forgive me of my sins. I've never asked Jesus to be the Lord and boss of my life. Well, if that's you, I've got good news for you today. You can do that right now. Would there be anybody here this morning that could get the least bit excited if somebody got saved this morning? Anybody? Anybody anywhere? Now, now what, what, about, what about all those other folks that are sitting here and they say, you know what, I know Jesus died for me. I, I, I realized that a long time ago. I know He took my place, but you know what? I just haven't been living like somebody who understands that because my actions don't display a heart of gratitude for what Jesus has done for me. Is that you this morning? Would there be anybody here this morning that could get just a little bit excited about a saved person getting right with God again? Anybody here this morning get excited about that? I sure could. So what about you? What are you going to do with this truth that the only begotten Son of God, sinless and perfect, chose to leave heaven, come to a sin-cursed world, take on a human nature, live a perfect sinless life, to die in your place to pay your death penalty, to be buried in a tomb, but to be gloriously raised three days later, to ascend to the Father, and to come again. What are you going to do with that truth? If you believe it, then it ought to change. I don't know what business you have to do with God this morning. I pray, oh God, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that there will be somebody here this morning that will come to know you this morning. Do you agree with that prayer this morning, church? Now maybe that's you. And if there's someone here this morning that just needs to get their life back on track with the Lord out of, out of a simple attitude of gratitude for what Jesus has done for you, then I want to invite both of you, whoever you are, both classes of people, I want to invite you while we're standing to sing our hymn of invitation, I want to invite you to come. Everybody's going to be singing. There's going to be plenty of noise to cover up you asking people to step out of your way so that you can get out the pew. Maybe you're here this morning, and, and I haven't described you yet, but let me see if I can describe you. You're just here this morning, and you are just overflowing with an attitude of gratitude for all that Jesus has done, and you just want to come and you want to praise Him this morning. Maybe that's you. I could get excited about that too. Whatever you need to do with Jesus this morning, don't you dare let Satan cheat you from the opportunity that's now yours. Take a stand for Jesus, and let's do it right now. Would you stand together as we sing? If you have business to do with the Lord, please come. Please come.